three or four times before he died. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. and I was actually in the process of making plans to travel to the small town in Virginia where he lived, uh, uh, right before he, he took ill unexpectedly and, and passed away. Uh, he caught pneumonia and, and just went downhill from from that point and and my plans went out the window. But I did have the opportunity to interview him a few times. I didn't I never got the I was very nervous about interviewing him before before I actually picked up the phone and, and called him. I it took me about a week or two to get a telephone number for him. Mm. As it turned out, um uh, his his number actually was publicly listed, uh, and I called him. And despite despite the fact that I was quite nervous because I thought, you know, from everything I had read, that I was going to be talking to a monster of a man. <laughs> it, I really had the impression, you know, I was talking to a, a very kind and seemingly gentle old man. Uh, and he was with me. He was he was very frank, very honest, uh, and made no excuses, uh, for what, for what he had done. I think uh, in a couple of cases, he, you know, he regretted some of the work he had done and he, and he made it clear that after he left the CIA, uh, he did things to atone for, for those things that he did wrong and, and that he felt good, uh, by his atonement. And, one of the things he had done after he resigned from the CIA was to go to India with his wife, who was the the daughter of a of a Protestant uh, missionary, and uh, he volunteered uh, along with his wife uh, to work in a leper colony in India for about two and a half years uh, without payment. I think you know. I think that's admirable. I don't. I don't think, in my view, and you know, and I said this to him. I don't think it excused uh, a lot of the a lot of the projects and experiments that you know the CIA and and his department conducted. But uh, and he understood that. Mm-hmm. And at that point, he went out of his way to attempt to explain to me that uh, I perhaps didn't understand that you know the country that the united states was engaged in a war even though it was a cold war at that time and uh despite the fact that you know there weren't a lot of uh, there wasn't a lot of visible violence there still was violence between the the communists and the united states and that people were dying and that he lost a number of friends but what he wanted me to appreciate was that he really, for most of his years at the CIA, he was operating under the under the belief that the country was at war and that uh, in in a situation of war, you do things you normally wouldn't do mm. in a time of peace. And that said, I I still took exception with with some of the things that he did. Uh, I don't I don't think the Cold War, Hot War, or whatever. Uh, uh, you know, excuse some of the experiments that were conducted, and yeah, and yeah. he respected my opinion. He didn't, never at any point did he try to argue with me. Mm. Uh, but for the most part, he was pretty open, uh, and and he answered questions when he when he felt comfortable, uh, and when he didn't feel comfortable, he just told me that that uh, you know he was very honest. Said I'd I'd rather not talk about that, or or I'm not going to talk about that. And uh, I was respectful of that also because I knew just the just the fact alone that I was talking with him um, was you know an opportunity to gain a lot of knowledge that that perhaps uh, you know had had not been gained uh, to date or had been overlooked. Yeah. D- did you uh, get any revelation, so to speak, from uh, Sidney Gottlieb in terms of what you haven't found out earlier in terms of researching documents and, and, and papers and the history, the official history? Well, I, I did, and, and it's scattered throughout the, uh, throughout the book. There's nothing, there's nothing that I would consider really, really shocking other than the fact that uh, he did confirm some of the more outlandish experiments that, that I wanted confirmed that I, I had minor suspicions that maybe they'd been exaggerated and they hadn't. And one of those that comes to mind right away was were the experiments that were conducted 
uh, with CIA money at the uh, narcotics farm uh, in Lexington, Kentucky, and and that was a well-known uh, rehabilitation federal facility that that served as a rehabilitation facility for heroin addicts uh, in the United States, uh, and it operated uh, fairly successfully through the 50s and 60s, and a large number of uh, well-known American jazz artists and and blues musicians and some writers even, uh, like William Burroughs, uh, went there for for rehabilitation uh, hmm. and to, you know, for, for cure of their their narcotics or heroin addiction. Uh, but one of the more outlandish experiments that had been conducted there uh, was with uh, African-American uh, patients there. They called them patients. I really considered them inmates because they were, they were unable to leave. Yes. Uh, but for some reason, the hospital there avoided the, the word inmates. But uh, they they ran a number of fairly aggressive LSD experiments with a, a number of the African American patients, uh, and they selected African American patients, I think, uh, primarily because of of racist racist attitudes, mm. because there were every racial group uh, in the United States was represented there, but for some reason. Uh, every document I read went went out of its way to underscore that they were working with African Americans. But what they did uh, in terms of the experiments with LSD there was was they they tried to do tests with the longevity of LSD in terms of well you know if a man were to take LSD at nine o'clock in the morning and then his experience or trip would begin to wear off by say maybe 5 or 6 p.m. Uh, if he were given LSD again, say at 6 or 7 p.m., would, would that in t re reinvigorate the trip or would it have no effect? And that gradually grew into research where, where these men were given LSD repeatedly uh, on a daily weekly and monthly basis to the point where some of these men were kept on LSD for 40, 40 to 45 days running. Uh, and I thought that was, you know, I, when I first heard about that, I thought that was a little hard to believe that somebody would even experiment with that, knowing, full well knowing the effects of LSD. I, I couldn't understand what, what knowledge would be gained from from operating an experiment like that, and Gottlieb, Gottlieb acknowledged that you know that experiment did take place, and but he kind of bowed out uh, of, of taking responsibility for explaining the rationale for the experiment. And I had, at that point in time, I had a number of documents that had been written by Dr. Harris Isbell, who was the the physician that that conducted and oversaw most of the experiments in Kentucky, and and he explained, you know, he basically explained what I just explained. That it was simply a you know a longevity experiment, right. uh, and beyond that, it didn't have much rhyme or reason, and there seemed to be little purpose for 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 conducting such a study. Yet it went on uh, for about a year and a half. It just was repeated, you know over and over and over again and one has to really wonder at the at the damage the both the you know the psychological and perhaps physical damage that mm. was done uh, with a number of these subjects unfortunately and i looked into that unfortunately uh, nobody uh, at least this is what i was told and i was fairly aggressive in terms of trying to find documents and paperwork but i was told that there were no follow-up studies done at any point in hardly any of the MK Ultra experiments that were conducted, and there were 147 contracts that were let, and that nobody kept the names of any of the subjects uh, that were experimented upon. And, and we're talking, with 147 sub-projects, we're talking hundreds, if not thousands, of, of experimental subjects uh, that we know absolutely.